Hi there, friends. My name's Eli. I'm here in Vancouver, Canada, and I'm one of the co-hosts along with Matt for this CMX chapter. This is the one focused specifically on the world of nonprofit and education, as we think those two groups are friends and not bitter rivals. So what we've got here today are three experts. We recruited them to come in and share some of the lessons they've learned working in the nonprofit and education space as managers, because unlike the technology space, the idea of being a community manager in that education nonprofit space is frankly a pretty new and rare role where we're not people who have a lot of peers out there. And so this is why we are also come here together because we are also desperate for validation and to know that we're not alone. I'm going to let my presenters give the rough bios because frankly, they know their lives better than me, but let me introduce three very quickly. So we've got Tina here, Tina Hill, who's come in actually from Finland and she works as a community manager with the Mannerheim League for Child Welfare in, South, in the Southwest Finnish region. And she has a really fascinating story about partnering with a larger organization, which I hope she shares, but I think it's a really interesting example, but she runs the largest community there for months. Our second expert we've got here is Tim, or maybe even Timothy Barley, depending on whether you're angry with him or not, you're being just called me. Um, he's a social media community manager with 11 years of experience, which frankly makes him a grizzled veteran in this sector, um, and also a background in television production. Very strange. He has been providing strategic thought leadership in the nonprofit space, and currently he is affiliated with the Prostate Cancer Foundation. And then our third panelist is Warren Carlisle, who's coming to us from Austin, Texas. And he is the founder of Octonation, the world's largest octopus fan club. I think we know where his passions and obsessions lie. The goal is to inspire people around the wonder of the ocean by teaching people about octopuses. So octopuses is an entry point into actually getting people to have the larger ocean conversation. So let's start off, Gina. Like, who are you and what is your top skill as a kid? I was waiting for this, who are you? And now I'm trying to focus on that starting with me being a mom. <laughs> but yeah, I'm based here in Finland and I, work, I ended up working in community management through the click that changed my life. I never thought that I'm going to be a community manager or plan to be a community manager, but I just wanted to get my friends together. And then in one night, it turned out that the entire region wanted to join. So the idea changed really quickly. And um, yeah, from that, we started, everything happened like it was supposed to happen at that point. And it all just made sense. But yeah, I'm also a mom. I have two kids and I have two bonus kids. I have a dog and I have a husband that is currently not at home. So if you hear fighting from the background or Netflix or anything, it's the kids. And uh, yeah, I, I used to be the person who says, I'm never going to join a mom group and I'm never going to do anything which is connected to this NGO I'm working with right now. And I said, I'm never going to be a stay at home mom. I also said, I'm never going to go back to work. And I did all of those things. So <laughs> this is who I am. That's, I actually going to steal that framing, the click that changed my life, because frankly, I think many of us have similar experiences in our lives. Tim, for you, do you have a, a click that changed your life and set you on this path? Uh, no. Frankly, I came out of the, like you pointed out earlier, I came out of the television world. I worked on the writing staff of sitcoms and in between my career as a full-time writer and social media community manager, I built a product placement and marketing agency, also working in TV and film. And then one day, I think it was after the, you know, the great recession here in the United States and around the world, I just noticed that social media was really taking off and I said, look, anybody can do this. And at that time, let's say the late, uh, late 2000s, early 2010s, 
at that point, it was really just people posting drunk photos of themselves, but can do that. But I knew marketing <laughs> and I knew social media, and there's that little Venn diagram of what I knew I could really apply. So before my time working in nonprofits, I did politics. And to get that taste out of my mouth, nonprofits was where I wanted to use my skills. And I ended up at the Prostate Cancer Foundation in June of 2017, and they didn't have much of a community at the time. And so I helped build, among the greatest accomplishments, our 12 private Facebook groups for men to find support and ask questions in a more private setting than they would if they just blasted them on open Facebook. I didn't have a click moment, but I kind of just saw where my talents could be better applied. Uh, so you did have that aha moment where you said, well, it's not just drunk and photo, but it could be, of course. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Social media in its early days was a wild west. There are some platforms that are still that way. I tried to steer clear of them um, <laughs> and provide a, a safe space, if you will, for people who just want support and the help. Yeah. Morton, do you have that aha moment, the thing that set you on tap? Like, yeah, I, it's funny, Timothy, actually, we have, there's like a similar theme with, except he used television, that film, I was in the fashion industry in New York, but I'll take it all the way back to my obsession with the octopus, which started when um, I was seven and went to an aquarium for the first time on a field trip. We were all supposed to be walking single file and we couldn't touch anything or look at anything for long periods of time. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to go to the back of the line. And then when no one's looking, I'm just going to drop off and take an aquarium tour by myself. Like I was that kind of kid. And, and so I went to the back of the line, dropped off, and I found myself wandering around the aquarium and I stopped in front of the octopus exhibit. And I just remember looking at it and being like, that thing looks alien. And at the time I was obsessed with like aliens as a kid and I had an alien bedspread. I had all, all, I've always been like a very like obsessive kind of person with my interests. And I went to the library to learn about it and there were no books, there were no resources, there were no, like there was nothing. And I was like, that's so crazy. There's all these resources on all these other animals, why not the octopus? And so I didn't really know what to do with my obsession until fast forward, I um, got an internship for a celebrity fashion photographer in New York. And after six months of working with him, I became his studio manager and started managing all of his strategic partnerships with J. Crew, Calvin Klein, Todd Snyder, all these big fashion brands and really learned influencer marketing inside and out. Why do certain brands choose to work with certain celebrities? What sort of values are we looking for? What sort of lifestyle brand are we trying to create? How do we create these marketing campaigns that draw in more of our audience? And I, that's when I discovered the book, The Soul of an Octopus uh, by Cy Montgomery. And she wrote in the first three pages that octopuses were always a demonized, misrepresented, mischaracterized animal. And so that's just the hand that they were dealt uh, in Hollywood films. That's just the hand people thought they were slimy, weird. And so I thought um, they just have a, they have a bad story. Somebody needs to tell their story in a more compelling and convincing way. And so I started writing about them as octopuses were the superheroes of the sea. Depending on where they lived in the ocean, they had a unique superpower that allowed them to be masters of their environment. And I took like the campaign route where like we would take a celebrity and we would create this campaign around them. I created campaigns around the octopus and lo and behold, they started going viral. I started doing the same thing that I would do with an influencer, but with an animal and started, you know, do, making these strategic marketing campaigns and pairing them with influencers and celebrities and doing these big activations at aquariums. And I didn't even plan on making the nonprofit until 2018. And people kept being like, how can I give you money? I want to give you money. And I'm like, we can't take your money. I'm just doing this. And so finally in 2018, when I kept getting asked on a daily basis to, for people to give us money, that's when I decided to found the nonprofit and uh, to get my community involved. Yeah, I think that is always a good sign when people want to give you money. And I know Tina's come into a similar place as well as she's found some funding to build some sustainability around her community. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to find out just like really quickly, three sentences. What about your community? If you're saying, oh yeah, there's lots of stuff there, but this one is because A, B, and C. Tim, what makes the work to prostate cancer society? I think what makes it unique, one, there aren't a whole lot of places that men and their families, let's, let's not sugarcoat it, men are horrible with their own health and 
prostate cancer is a touchy subject, no pun intended on that. But what we provide, what's different about the Prostate Cancer Foundation is that we have built these communities, these groups, if you will, where we share a lot of educational material. It's like I said, men are bad at their health, but we share easy to digest information. We share a lot of support and we bring in families. I think it's something that uh, other organizations may or may not do. They're primarily geared for men, but there's wives, there's sons, there's daughters, there's mothers, fathers, et cetera. I think we, what we do specifically is really incorporate the whole family into the prostate cancer messaging, the education, what can be done. And we're on the forefront. Prostate Cancer Foundation is 20, gosh, I'll probably get close to 30 years old, but um, 28, 29 years old. It's the largest funder, non-government funder of prostate cancer research in the world. So we share that education in the community. I, I try not to market, hit people over the head and give us money. I think we provide all the information and support and everything. And people then in turn continue to fund for us. Cool. Then how do you actually onboard people, especially men? Because I think we're going to talk to Tina. Oh, maybe this is a different place with the different people. Like, what is your trick to getting men who are maybe reluctant to have them start these conversations to, to initially engage? Yeah, it was really tough when I came in five years ago. We didn't have much of a social media presence, or we did had a digital presence, but not really a focus towards digital social media. And I think then one of the biggest things we did was develop new social channels. They had an Instagram account, but it wasn't a big Instagram account. And I'm like, look, if we need to reach the wives, the sons and the daughters to, ed to help educate them so they can educate their husbands, brothers, sons, et cetera. So I think what we did is we branched out into different social media outlets to help build the community. A lot of what we have now is word of mouth growth or just basic search on Google or Facebook or whatever they can, they find us. And so Tina, talk to me a little bit about what's unique about your community uh, of moms, because there are, there are lots out there, but people are coming to you because there's, there must be something unique about it. Yeah, I think the main reason what, or the main thing that makes us unique is that it's really a mom's community for every mom. There's a bunch of baby groups over there or toddler groups. And somehow, even though there are mom who join them, it's all about the kids. It's not all about the mom. So it's really a community for moms. I think our youngest member is under 18 right now. And our oldest member is over 80. So we have a range of moms there. And our goal is because Finland is, I think Finland, the thing that Finland is known for is that Finns don't talk much. <laughs> it is just like the men's group after all. Yeah. Yeah, it is. But Finns don't talk much and, and they might live in an apartment and never talk to their neighbors like ever. And through this community, they have actually realized it took them a social media group to realize there's other families living in the same house that they can actually talk to or that other mom that keeps on showing up in the same park um, or at the same playground, you can talk to her and, and they found people they can talk with and a place where I see, I, I think parenting is also something that makes you feel lonely every now and then, because you always have this guilt and you have this pressure to do the right thing. And if you're succeeding and if you're working too much or too little, and should you study a bit more or help the kid with their homework or is the house clean enough? Or can I just leave the dishes and not do them today and just focus on doing nothing and this kind of thing. And it helps a lot when you have a place where you can say this out loud and somebody else is thinking about the exact same things. And it's because it's moderated, it's a safe place. It's not a group where, where you're going to get mom bashed for saying, you know what, today I don't feel like being a mom at all. <laughs> I just need a day off. So I think this is one thing that makes it really unique because you can say it out loud. And that comes into my next question, which is like, why do people come to your community? It sounds like it is really about that peer experience. 
it's the, the place to have the, those safe private discussions. Is that also what keeps people in there long term? So if someone's been there a year, does their interaction change a little bit over time? We have like most, really a lot of the active members are, have been members since the beginning. So of course it changes because seven years ago they had babies and now they have seven year old kids or the ones who had kids that are at preschool now have kids that are heading to high school. So it changes a bit, but it also brought a lot of new things. I think we have 30 subgroups right now with different kind of themes, moms that raise their kids alone or moms of teenagers and kids with special needs or moms that like to go ride a horse together. We even have a choir, I think at this point. So there's everything. And I think being local is what keeps them coming back because you can see everything that's going on in the city. The city tells um, the families what to do this weekend, different companies or, or other NGOs, everybody is on that community. So it's also a calendar on what happens in the city or in the right. region. So the locality, the, the focus geography, and I imagine also language also are part of what gives you a, a unique space. Yes. So Warren, over to your side of the world, what thing brings people initially into your community? Like what's the top of that funnel? I think it's the, the fact that a lot of them have never seen different types of octopuses before. Everybody's very familiar with the octopus with eight arms and the, the way an octopus looks, but there's over 300, you know, different species. And, and like I was mentioning earlier, they've been on this planet for longer than dinosaurs. And so octopuses exist in every single ocean. They're along every single coastline in the world. And depending on where they live, they have a really unique adaptive trait or superpower that allows them to be masters of that given environment. And so we storytell around species that people have never heard of. We hear all the time. I, I, this is the first time I'm ever hearing of this. Why is this the first time they're like upset? Like, why is this the first time? <laughs> Someone's been hiding this from me the whole yeah. time. Yeah. And so give like, me a nice example of that. Like one of those stories. So, yeah, so, so storytelling is the way that brings, you bring people in. Yeah, there's a species that exists in a very sandy environment. It's called the sand octopus, and it's evolved to, to not be able to change colors. And we, when we think of the octopus, we think, oh, they're these color changing, transforming individuals. But that served no purpose in this very sandy kind of desolate environment. And so this species learned it, it evolved to not have chromatophores at all because that wasn't helpful in it surviving. But what it does is it can create it. It can blow itself a foot underground. It secretes a mucus to reinforce the sandy walls around it. It creates a ventilation shaft with one of its arms and it can burrow and breathe essentially while it's underground to protect itself against predators. And there's just so many different stories like this where, and it, it also goes into the, the curriculum that we create for early learning and education, where can you be resilient in your environment? Can you adapt in your environment like a superhero octopus? So we create a lot of um, content just around the different concepts, not just the octopus in itself, but we use it as a symbol for a lot of different things, for resiliency, adaption, intelligence, problem solving, multitasking. There's a lot of different ways that you can use it as a symbol. And then through that kind of anchor people's affinity to the ocean through something as you know clever and intelligent as the octopus. So that's how we've thought of it uh, and mapped out our campaigns. Because that was... My next question, which is clearly you're never going to burn out an octopus, but there is a chance that maybe not everyone is quite as hardcore. And yeah. so, the, yeah, so how do you keep people in that over time? And so, like, why do they stay? Like, basically, what is the motivation for each engagement? Yeah, this goes back to your earlier question, which is what makes our community different. And I'd say a, a large part of our community is user generated content. So we have, because I have no background in marine biology or science or anything like that. I just truly understand marketing, engagement, collaborating with the right people who have something to say, who are inspirational, who do have amazing content. And I essentially in the background as an octo DJ, keeping everybody dancing. And we have, we, we have to get this multi pronged approach where it's just, we have arts. So really the, some of the coolest internationally renowned sculptors and artists, painters, we have underwater photography, and this is a very user-generated thing where 
we have underwater photographers from literally every part of the world. And because octopuses exist in every part of the world, we just, we have a global audience and we have people that utilize Octonation as a way to share their discoveries. And we have, we've had a lot of discoveries occur in our group, a lot of new species that have been discovered. Some taxonomists that are like, I've never seen that before. Where did you find that? Because we want to send a research vessel out there ASAP. So we've connected that, that group of scientists, but also like the, the people who are interested really in the science, but they are really compelled by this new creature and they learn, they build this affinity to the ocean. Whereas I feel like a lot of kids nowadays are, are very apathetic. They don't really know where they fit into ocean literacy or anything like that. We incorporate like this childlike wonder or look at how amazing this creature is. And they're like, wow, that is pretty cool. And then they start learning about it. And then all of a sudden they're like, okay, tell me about another one. Okay. Tell me about another one. <laughs> Yeah, and it's very much like Pokemon. Once you catch one, you got to catch them all. Um, right. just, and you yeah, and another thing that, they, to me that really resonates here is that idea of when we have a successful, we're not creatures. Rather, yeah. we are playing what I often call, for my more boring world, a being a curator, more of a museum yeah. style. I love your idea of being the DJ, basically the one saying, yeah, here's all the great content from it. Which one should I feature? How should I feature it? It's a great way to think around around like just how do we take what's happening here and, and shift and present it and from because we're a brand um Oxygenation, the largest octopus bank club a nonprofit organization you also have to be very conscious of your values uh, and very conscious of what content you feature and what content we just say this isn't okay so we have a lot of very strong core values in our group like there's no aquarius shaming you're not going to come in and say drain the tanks in Oxygenation, like aquarius on the front line of ocean conservation so there's a lot of hardcore values we put in place so that it remains this positive environment. We also are not an animal rights organization. So if you come in and you're, you want to talk about saving the planet or octopuses are being chopped up and served on plates, we're not the space for that. There's a time and there's a place to have that conversation. And we feel like it gets in the way of really our main mission, which is how do you, we create that affinity to the ocean without the world getting in the way of like massive amounts of pollution. And there's organizations that do that. We really want to spark that ocean wonder and that affinity before people getting apathetic or before they get nihilistic about where the state of the world is. It's like, first, let's like look at how amazing these creatures are and, and really solidify their love for them. So I think that's a, a reason why people stay in our organization while we're featured by like Facebook or Meta now and a lot of different organizations is because we keep out those very negative polarizing conversations because that's just not the role of our organization who we are and like what the top will yeah help keep things in the right direction so for you tim when you look at your community what do you think your top for that community to make sure it it continues on a healthy path oh sorry tim you got you're on mute still in the meantime tina i'm going to put you on the spot with the same question what do you think your number one top it says it right here. So <laughs> yeah, that's the main thing. I don't think it, it needs any explaining to do, but I do, I do think it's exactly like Warren just said, it's like being the DJ of the party. You don't, you don't have to know about everything about parenting. I have two kids, but I'm really not an expert. I'm just one mom. So we have a lot of experts and, and my role is to see that it's still a safe place for everyone. Everyone is respecting each other and that we get content that they need. Right. Tim, are you able to come join us? Perfect. Does that work? Yeah, never in. All right. Technical difficulties, somehow I get through the day. I think for the, the, the foundation, I think um, less is more, I think. We invite people, as opposed to being, Warren, you're the Octo DJ, I'm kind of, the community DJ, and I just let people bring themselves in and be the focus. I don't want to be the person that, you know, is dictating everything. We have across, across our groups, we have about 20,000 members active on any given day or week. So I let them share what they want. I let them bring the conversation. I just act as a little bit more of a moderator. I have a team of member mo moderators that I manage, but I let them do all the heavy lifting it as it is. I set ground rules and our success is that we can provide both support 
and safe answers for people. And it's a terrible um, diagnosis, cancer in general. I've been through it years ago and it just stops you cold in your tracks, not prostate cancer, uh, a different type of cancer, but I feel with my, my members and it's just, okay, I understand that cold sweat, you know, what you're going through. So feel safe here is where our success is. It should be, should be on our top of our groups. Feel safe here. Mm. Yeah, I like that a lot because I think, yeah, especially if people are coming in at a difficult and vulnerable time of their lives. So Absolutely. we're going to move into the second half of this conversation, which also means you should be dropping questions, friends, into the Q&A, and we will then ask you yeah, or put you on the spot, maybe put you on camera. But either way, throw something into the chat, and I'll make sure it comes back at our expert presenters here today. But let's talk a little bit about success and measure. And so I'd love to get a sense, actually, Warren, did you, because I normally, here's the thing, I normally take these questions and say, what does success look like to you? And then what does it look like to the boss? In your case, Warren, might be both of those things. So give me your big picture. What does, what does success look like to you in this world? Yeah, success looks like to me, I go back to our vision, which is to inspire wonder of the ocean by educating the world about octopuses. And as long as we're doing that, in a, a really fun way and I'm seeing results, then I'm happy with that because I've, I come from a world where, you know, the fashion industry I've worked with the top brands want to do the same when it comes to Octonation, which is why we've been featured by Joe Rogan. We've been featured by Ellen DeGeneres, Meta. Like I go after big players because I really want people to understand how incredible this animal is and how much we don't know about it and how many different, how incredible the ocean is, because I really feel like as a kid, when there weren't that resource, there weren't that many resources and the resources weren't there because the market wasn't there. I thought there's this really great opportunity online to create the market for something that matters as opposed to creating a market for, I don't know, some surface level thing that doesn't really have that much of an impact to the planet. And so I feel like you can mix the two in a way from the standpoint of just me. There's a campaign that I created called Interview with an Octopus, where I go to aquariums all over the world and I interview and play with an octopus and have our audience ask questions on Facebook Live. I um, want to watch that right now. Yeah. And this next year, I'm doing an interview with an octopus with a celebrity and I'm interviewing, I'm bringing celebrities in to essentially experience an octopus, dispel any myth that their audience might have oh my gosh, does that hurt? Or is it thinking about biting you? These are all fears that we get all the time when um, people are like, say, interacting with an octopus because of old films or because of whatever. They're just really scared and frightened. Yeah, sorry, Ward. So success looks to you like basically increased like awareness of awesomeness. Yeah. Well, my, the fact that my octopus- Do you have a number on that? Like, is, how do you know that you're increasing awesomeness? Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't really think I've, I've defined that I keep plugging and chugging. Um, when my octopus teacher won the Oscar, like that was a huge indication to us that you know, the market was opening up to the compassion of the octopus. I'm being, you know, contacted by other documentaries that are in creation. They want Octonation to be a part of it. We're doing our first international photography competition for octopus this year in a really big way, sponsored by a lot of really big companies. So to me, I'm doing my job because we're inspiring ocean wonder by educating the world about octopuses as a result of the activations that we're doing at a high level and the fact that we're developing curriculum to go into early learning and education right. in Texas and then nationally. So I'm just, I also have ADHD. So like when I get hyper-focused on something, I just make it like, make it all happen. And I can't really stop thinking until, until it's all happened. And I've been on this path for about five years now. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so that's, yeah, so that's your success. Your success right now is not number focused. Tim, over on your side of the world, what does for you success look like? To me, and it's probably a little different to, for my boss, for, but for me, every time somebody shares a comment in our groups that we're absolutely so glad to be here, which is a tough thing to say. You want to be in a cancer group, right? But the fact that they say it, it's like, we're so happy to have found this group, exclamation point. That is a win. That's a success for me. But when people say that they have found some place that they feel supports them, gives them answers, that is my kind of, that's my success. I pull those comments and I share them all the time. And from the prostate 
cancer foundation side of things, organizationally, how do they basically justify and tell the story of why they invest in the time in this community? I think it's it, to them, probably the higher up you get, the more focus they get on numbers, on hard data, how many members of it uh, has grown. I think I've grown those, the groups probably, I think 60% year over year for the last five years. The numbers continue to grow. They like that little line that goes up that and the donations that people make for the kind of the support and the education and what they're seeing that PCF does for the prostate cancer world. I think that kind of is the, is the epitome of its success the higher up you go. You right. Know. So there is a bit of a donor stewardship story to be told within it as well. Yeah. Let's not kid ourselves. That's how, not, how our nonprofit funds everything. We turn around 82, 82 cents on the dollar is spent towards research. All that is coming from large and small donors. Cool. And so Tina, from your side, your personal success, like if you have, like when you basically wake up tomorrow and open up, you know, the Facebook page and you see something. What is that su most successful thing that makes you feel like, yes, I nailed it, feel like? What does it look like? Well, I actually, I'm, I'm so stoked that we have this question right now because I just had that feeling today. We had a mom asking for help. Actually, it wasn't even asking for help. It was more of a last cry for help that she has been trying to contact everyone in the city from social workers, everything to get help for her child. And also for herself and her other ch children as well. And after she wrote an anonymous post, so she wouldn't be recognized, but her post was seen by everyone in the city. So everyone reached out to me and then I reached out to the mom. And now the, the end is that because she cried for help and she wrote an honest story about what their everyday life looks like. She got the help that she needed, that people who knew how the things work, what you need to say, where to, where you need to say it, where do you need to, to make a phone call? What is there to help your child? She got the help that she needed and she did, she get, she got it in 48 hours. She has been waiting for help for five years. So that is mission accomplished. You're like, this, so is, for me, you this is mission accomplished all the way. And also just to hear that someone who has been really lonely isn't lonely any, anymore and has a place to belong. So that's something that means more to me than anything else, even though it should mean because we also need the funds to, to function. But for me, it's all about the passion of bringing people together and closer together and giving this community feeling in this land where they don't communicate. So I want to take that to go to the organizational side of the question. So you recently partnered with the Mannerheim League for Child Welfare, a big established organization. And so instead of going off creating your own thing, you've actually merged into a big organization. What, why did they do that? Why did they decide that this investment is worthwhile for them? The why is really interesting, but yeah, we stumbled across each other when we had a post about that NGO, not in a friendly way <laughs> and their manager got curious and joined us. And then we just started talking and we noticed we have a lot of things in common, but we had this, I think it's a traditional thing that you have an old organization and they have things in the social media, but they don't know what to do with it. Seriously, teddy bears, teddy bear pictures around the building today, the teddy bear is sitting in the kitchen and Tomorrow, the teddy bear is sitting in the hallway kind of post. So we had all the families they want to reach in our community. So it made sense to, to work together. And uh, it changed a lot because like I said, I'm a passion led person all the way through. I also have ADHD. That's why I had to show some love to Warren. I think it drives a long way and it helps a long way. I think it's a superpower. And I had to learn how to Excel stuff. I had to put stuff into sheets and just start showing them why it makes a difference without inviting them into the community. 
So to my boss, success looks like an Excel sheet that shows to the government why we need more funds. Can I jump in for a second? Go for it. Because there's a question that I think that leads right into this. Nivia Chanta asked in the chat to, to everybody about what are some of the hardest decisions you've had to make on your community journey, especially around trade-offs between mission and money. And so I think this, the, what you're talking about, Tina, really leads into that. What are some of the trade-offs that you've had to make in, 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 in making this? Oh, wait, here she is. Oh, hello. Oh, wow. Magic. I'm a celebrity now. Yeah. So I basically was curious about in general, the, some of the hardest decisions you've had to make, but also specifically since I am building a social impact and environmental impact company, I feel like I'm internally constantly conflicted about growth strategies and have to think extra hard about things like ethics and tone policing and all of that stuff. So I'm curious to know what some of those decisions might have been for you and even like mistakes that you've learned along the way that would just be really helpful to learn more about. I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> I would say that the, the biggest thing is honestly getting help for myself and understanding that if I want to grow this organization, I need to get out of my own way. And that I, my mom would always say this when I was growing up, but she would always say, are you, she was, a, she was also a psychologist, but she was like, are you focus group of one right now? Meaning, have you had this conversation with anybody other than yourself? And oftentimes for me, no, I just made the assumption that everybody knew what I knew and I didn't want to talk. And so I had to go through a lot of therapy to actually like check in with people and do that. But as far as the nonprofit was concerned, I had no background in nonprofits whatsoever. I didn't go to school for that. I'm a classical saxophone performance major. So ADHD. And, and so I hired an executive leadership coach to help me grow my nonprofit organization because I was wanting, I was doing essentially all the work. I was working, you know, 15 hours a day. I was like, I have to make this happen. And he was like, no, he's like, your superpower needs to be enrolling other people into the mission so that you can grow your organization. And it took me almost like a year of working with him before I started making my first hires and bringing people on and really feeling and giving up that, that control and, um, and rolling other people into the mission. So now we have a creative director. Now we have a elite scientist. We have a team of science writers we have. So we're growing the organization and it's, it's bigger than it's ever been as a result of me doing the work for me and getting the work that I need to get done so that I can let go of more and think through things and and incorporate my team and, and my staff into what we do and see if they're interested instead of me just feeling like the weight of the octopus <laughs> and is on my shoulders. So yeah, I'd say that, that was the biggest thing that for me is like before I could help everybody else, I really needed to get therapy and I really needed to uh, hire an executive leadership coach to help me delegate things. Yeah. Say plus one to what Warren said, because I'm actually in that phase right now that I should be working 100% in another project where we teach community managing to all the employees of our NGO. But then again, I have this community where I want to be present all the time. And now we hired our two new community managers and I'm in the process of trying to let go and delegating and just trusting that they're going to do what's best. Be in a different way that I would do it. So yeah, thoughts one to that. Exactly. The movie Frozen, I think, is so powerful for all of us. We do need to let go as community managers, to let our community actually thrive to succeed and, and, and own it themselves. Because if it is all on us, will it be done the way we like it? Yes, but we'll survive. We will make it through. Just uh, to have the conversation around money. Because that always came up with, with me and I think Elijah, when you were asking me, okay, what's your number? I didn't really think about that from the standpoint of, I have somebody, my partner who works with all the monetization and does that. But I realized after I hired my creative director, how powerful merch and money and getting my community involved was. And I find myself still playing that ethical role where I'm like, I understand like what my creative director wants. And I also understand, I don't want to seemingly come across as exploitating the animal as a result of, and so I, I play this fine line and oh, okay, if we're going to do this or we're going to sell this thing, then how can I interweave purpose? And so we have a merch line called uh, the Octo Barista series and it's 
species specific octopuses uh, oh. coffee. And essentially, you can learn about the species. This is a blue ringed octopus. It has the skull and crossbones because they have TTX, which is a thousand times more deadly than cyanide. And so, yes, we're, we're selling merch. Yes, we have it on stickers and things like that. But we're also educating in the process and giving an entry point of people to talk about their favorite animal while they're educating. And so it just it goes into the mission of inspiring wonder of the ocean by educating the world about octopuses. So every aspect of our community and our brand does that. So I feel good about that. And so that's how I'm balancing the two with ethics and, um, you know, selling merch and all that stuff. Can I ask a really quick follow up for everyone? Do you have any like decision making frameworks that you use on these things? Because I found myself being like, oh, yeah, this sounds purposeful. And then it's maybe not like with the stickers thing. I thought that was hard to think through. Where is the line between? having that merch and having it be worth the educational conversations. So do any of you have any decision-making frameworks that you use or like any filter that helps you decide, okay, this is not every aspect of this is part of the mission, for example, creating merch, but overall it pushes us farther in the direction that you need to go. Yeah, I, ch I check in with my, like, I was going to say, I just check in with my community. That's my kind of like my framework. <laughs> is like yeah. pr proposing the ideas to them. I, I keep like them a part of everything that every decision that I make, I, I bring them like a well thought out kind of idea or plan. Um, and oftentimes in the beginning, I was like, a lot of times they were just like, no, we're not interested in this at all. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's surprising. So I run it through the community and say, hey, here's, who we're, here's where we're at. This is how this would help this. And they're like, oh, have you thought of this? I'm like, oh, that would have been 10 times easier. So it's having this focus group that has your best interest at hand at your disposal, not disposal, but at your resource. Yeah. What about you? For, you know, for our groups, I, I like Warren said, I listen into the group. Um, a lot of what we provide as far as merch, and there's not a whole lot of prostate cancer merch out there, let's be honest. But blue wristbands have always been the great signifier of like somebody who supports prostate cancer research. Recently, and this is something I brought to our entire digital team, Somebody suggested in one of our private Facebook groups said, Hey, every time I go to the doctor, he gives me all this information and I forget it the minute I walk out there. And what about little notebooks? So I brought this to the team and they're like, that's a fantastic idea. So uh, we have another kind of piece of merch, if you will, going forward, coming from our groups of what they felt would be the best for them. So we're working on creating these small little notebooks that they can take people to take notes while in the doctor's office, um, especially because it's a, an older man's disease. You've got a lot on your uh, brain as you get older and faculties may not be there. So writing everything down is an important part. But like Warren said, I think listen to the community, get feedback from them along those, along those lines. Right. So we're moving into our five, five, sorry, go ahead, Matt. I just had a follow-up question for, for Tim from Julie Blau. I don't know if you want to jump on and see if you want to ask this question yourself around around kind of entry points and how you're reaching out to reaching out. Oh, okay. So Julie's question, and it's we were talk, touched on this a little bit earlier with when Warren was talking about how to do outreach, and Julie was asking if if you reach out to kids, if there's a if there's a if there's an element of the work that you do that's reaching out to children. So that was something that when I first came in, almost like I said, almost five years ago, we weren't really reaching the sons and the daughters of men with prostate cancer, if you will. And the number one thing we did was really amp up the amount of content we were putting out on Instagram, because that's where you were reaching the younger audiences. I'm really trying to get them into TikTok now. I find it a big time waster, but boy, there's a lot of young people on it. So why not reach them there? That's a hard slog, especially with an organization that's um, a bit more conservative. And that's what I've run into in the past is sharing more light content and bringing some levity to the prostate cancer diagnosis. It's something that I have a back and forth with my superiors, if you will, feeling the need to bring a lighter touch to engage younger people. And so that's something that I get pushed back and I pull and I push and I pull and trying to find a, a middle ground that will bring in those younger people. Yeah, so we're moving into our final five minutes. So I want to just end maybe with a question going around to the team. So Tina, let's start with you. What is your top priority for this coming year? Looking forward. 
Like, what do you top thing want to get done this year? My top goal for myself is to <laughs> to succeed in letting go and um, trusting the team, but also to come up with new projects. We're working on merch as we speak, as well. Um, trying to com combine the new upcoming communities that I'm currently count coaching the, the new community managers for trying to get that all in one picture because we're uh, a nationwide NGO and we work on very different regions. It's all cold in the winter, but it, it is a difference if you're in the southwest of Finland or in Lapland. So I'm trying to come up with, with something that makes the community the same for, for moms over here and in Lapland. And we also are starting in the next, I think, month or two, a dad group. So obviously I'm not going to run it, but I'm um, trying to help them to start that. So that is super exciting that the work for the year is basically to recreate what you've done and train more community managers. I, th I think that's great. And that really, I think, speaks to you. How do we scale? How do we let go? How do we make sure it isn't all this centralized in us and all the knowledge is stuck in our brain until we get hit by a bus and then the knowledge is gone? Kim, in your work, what's your top priority for 2022? What do you want to see your community do or, or happen with it? We, as an organization, we've touched on this a little bit. We we do a lot of interviews with doctors and what they're working on. I what I would like to do and that I'm working on the deck right now for this is to remove that um, barrier between doctors and patients. I want to do a lot more engagement. I want to do a lot more live interactions like this in a way. I want people to see what the researchers are doing by talking to the researchers. I know it's one thing to read about all the work that the foundation does. It's one thing to tell them about all the money we've raised and what we're all the new researchers that we're funding, but I would like to get those researchers here and the people, the patients here and have them interact more. I think that's one of the goals I would like to see happen is a lot more face to face. And it's going to be a tough, it's a, it's going to be a tough slog first to pitch it and sell it to the internals, but then to get those researchers that aren't so science speak yeah. that they don't make a good interview type. So that is, it's a big. The deck is already 47 pages long. <laughs> I'm trying to say, because I, do I cut that down or do I keep going with the way I want it to go? As a writer, I just go all the way till the end and I figure out what needs to be done. That's in the you know challenge is just trying to make that connection is going to be the, the uh, it would be a win for 2022 if we can bring these people together. Right. To bring in the experts and like the patients and some of the end users together. I think that's Absolutely. a really interesting challenge and a really great goal for the coming year. Warren, what's your top priority for this coming year? Yeah, I, I have this uh, full circle moment fantasy in my head. Um, like going back to where, when I mentioned that I was that kid in the library when I was seven, really interested in something that I, I just became obsessed with and there was nothing there. This idea that how can I create everything that I would, I would have wanted at that age to continue my passion and to continue my exploration into the ocean and something that inspired me. And so this year, because we have a rock star team with our creative director, our lead scientists and our writers, really developing that curriculum, we came up with a concept called Octopus Superhero Academy where it takes kids through like these workshops of what all the superpowers of an octopus are, uh, also teaches them resiliency, teaches them what's your superpower. And, and I really want to make it this fun, interactive thing where when people leave, they're just like, wow, I, like I had no idea this is something that I'm interested in now. Um, and so we're working on that and we're launching it in, at STEM Fest in Dallas in July, and then hopefully rolling it out statewide and then hopefully nationwide. And so right now I'm looking at grants, looking at the funding that it would take to, to make this thing roll out nationwide. And so that's what I'm really focused on this year is creating that environment for, for kids to really flourish and have everything that they need to get their obsession on as it relates to something that they're interested in. <laughs> Absolutely. No, nothing is more exciting than allowing and enabling people to go deep into their passions 